All right, with that, I think we're recording. And with that, let's begin. This is episode 62 of Burrows and Burbs. And I have special guests, Reja Bach, modern architect, he began his career with Charles Guathme and then with Richard Meyer. And his firm, Bach, has offices in New York, Shanghai, and Australia. Welcome, Reja. Oh, thank you. Also with me today is Robert Dean, also a modern architect, began his career with Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill, and with Philip Johnson and Robert A. M. Stern, and has run his firm in New Canaan for the last 30 years. So welcome, gentlemen. I'm so honored to have both of you um, rather famous architects, you know, on the show today talking about modernism as we understand it, getting a, a little bit of the history of modernism and then charting a course for where is it headed. So with that, um, would you like to say a few words in the introduction? Well, I'll just jump in and say I'm, I'm looking forward to this uh, conversation and um, I love talking about modernism, about architecture, about New Canaan, and uh, this it's an opportunity to talk about all of those things. Yeah, same here. It's um, it's architecture is the core of everything I do. So kind of having this modern architecture is quite interesting to have this lively conversation and see other points of view on this subject would be fantastic. So Roberto, let me explain how I came to know Reja. Reja was one of the Architectural Digest top 50 architects in the world. And I wrote him a letter and I said, hey, we've got some great moderns here in New Canaan. Check it out. And he came out. He answered my, my postcard and he came out and he looked at some of these moderns. Long story, story short, he bought Philip Johnson's Alice Ball House of 1954. Goodness. So he owns one of the original mid-century moderns. And I said, well, what are your plans? And he said, you know, I, I love this stuff. And I, uh, so I want to, I want to live in it, but I work in New York and I work internationally. And you've had ideas, Reja, about the future of modernism and how you might make that house maybe more modern, how you might make that house and other houses, um, I guess, more livable for the 21st century. So you want to tell us a little bit about Absolutely. your Absolutely, Ray, John. Ray, the one, yeah, the one part you missed, John, was the fact that I did tell you the only project I've ever lost sleep on was this house. I've never worked, I never lost sleep on any other project in my career except for this house. So it was challenging. So, Raja, let me ask you: Were you coming from the city, and this was your uh, first foray into a more suburban environment, or? Yes, yes. I lived on 49th and First in New York for 20 plus years. Um, at the UN Plaza, 870 UN Plaza for many, many years. And then, but I was doing a lot of international travel. So I was doing a lot of projects in Asia and Australia and all over the place. So I would go for extensive time, like two or three months at a time uh, overseas to do large scale projects. But before I was with Richard Myers office in New York for many years also. So we did a lot of projects internationally and including Charles Street and Perry Street project downtown so and what's Meyer most famous for uh minimalist white on white um clean simple incredibly detailed buildings um it just it, the detail was phenomenal the attention to detail was incredible so can we can we start super broad and just have kind of a very simple history lesson as to modernism started here and it came about because of and it was people responded to it how and it has evolved just to just to kind of lay the groundwork for where we'll go robert you want uh, to talk about that sure as a ex-professor of architecture i guess i'm the person to do that the um uh modernism came out of everything that happened in, in uh, 20th century art. You know, how do we break free of these um, 
canons of, uh, of artistic discipline and do something that is more abstract and uh, uh, focused on uh, something very much more basic about what the, uh, what the world looks like, how things go together artistically and technically. And that started really in Europe. In this country, we were, we were actually advancing the technology really rapidly. A 1920s New York skyscraper is a very advanced building, but we weren't advancing the artistic side of it. In fact, we were resisting that. And in Europe, it was the opposite. They barely had control of the technology, but they, they were all about rethinking the art of architecture and, and every other visual art. And so that came of a, you know, kind of as a set piece to the United States with a few people who pioneered it. And one of those people, one of the key people was the great impresario of architecture, Philip Johnson, who as a 20 something year old, non-architect, he was a curator at the Museum of Modern Art, put together the International Style Show, which gave this a name, International Style, gave it a list of characters, cast of characters, all those European modernists, plus George Howe and William Lascaz in the United States. And he gave, and it gave us a body of uh, work. You know, this is what it looks like. And uh, that, that was a very creative act. That was an amazing creative act and it changed things in the United States, not overnight, but uh, very profoundly. Really took until some of these practitioners were under pressure from uh, the German government in the 1930s and they started to look for a new home that they came rapidly to this country and uh, set up shop and uh, built uh, a body of work in this country and made modernism mainstream in this country. And- So are you uh, saying that it was, it began in Europe in the thirties, but it began in America in the fifties? It began in Europe in the teens and twenties, came to the US, in around 1940 and flowered in the 50s. Okay. And, and, what and, was the and first, what were the first like incarnations that I You didn't have a glass house in the 19, you know, 20s, did you? No. You did in I, Europe. Yeah, they did, did in you? Europe. Did you? Uh, yeah. And, and uh, in the 1920s, there was a body of work, mostly German, Dutch, and French architects who, uh, were adventuring into this new abstract world in combination with visual artists and, and people in the crafts. To, uh, and the Bauhaus in Germany in the 20s was the, the place where it really solidified into a movement. This house is 1929 in France. So just to give you a sense of what they were doing in the 20s in France. Yeah, exactly. And um, so, so then, you know, this was brought here. Uh, the, you know, Harvard brought Gropius and Breuer to teach at Harvard and to remake the curriculum. They did, they called it the Bauhaus in America, or it was sometimes called that. And, uh, and it just flowered from there with with um, Philip Johnson in there poking it with a stick and making sure it kept uh, going. And, uh, and after the war, as these people like Breuer gravitated to New York to you know, set up a major practice and Johnson gravitated back to New York and um, uh, New Canaan became a, a place outside New York for this to really flower. It's really an amazing story. Uh, and, um, uh, and it produced not only the people we now call the Harvard Five, but all this host of other people like James Evans, who's the architect of the house uh, where there's a, um, 
tour wrapping up today in New Canaan. Uh, just a host of these people all plying their craft. So uh, not to dominate this whole thing with the history lesson, but is that enough of a history lesson? Yeah, yeah. I think it's good, but let's put it in perspective. In a, in a town of, of 7,000 houses, we had 90 of these built and maybe 45 or 50 of them survived. And this is one of the great concentrations of mid-century modern architecture in the country alongside of Palm Springs. And we got some going on in Miami. So there's a few concentrations around the country. This is one of them. And we only have 50 houses. So one of my first questions, and uh, we could either go to Robert or to Rasha with this is, so if this is a movement, how come there isn't more of it? What's the problem? Because we admire this. I think I see some uh, houses that pay homage to the mid-century moderns on the beaches on the Hamptons and, on the, and in Malibu, but why don't I see more of it? Either of you? Marisha? Um Very good question. Very, very good question. Um, I think it's changing. I think that attitude is changing a little bit. Um, people who lived in the city are coming out to the suburbs. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure you guys can see that in the market. Um, that layer of interest in um, the loft style living in Soho, people are coming out into the suburbs and not seeing anything that would fit that kind of a lifestyle that they have in the city. So I think that is slowly changing. Uh, I was just in Montauk this last weekend and I saw probably, I walked into about, 10 construction sites and out of the 10, eight of them were pure modern architecture or modern yeah. buildings. Yeah, I see it. It's sort of like a movie plot, you know? There was the, um, you know, the, the couple meet, they go through all kinds of stuff. They have a big fight, it's all over. Then in the end, uh, uh, love conquers all and the um and the love in this case is a love of, of something new and modern and the um uh so it was it's it's always been an elevated exercise you know it's not uh it's not the ford model t you know the ford model t was a wonderful example of uh, a high-tech product of its day, but it wasn't a high-style product. Uh, uh, Rolls-Royce of the same era was, uh, I'm quoting here an author who wrote a book about this, uh, uh, was not a high-tech product, but it was a wonderful uh, aesthetic exercise. So we went through, we've gone through 75 years of trying to integrate this into our culture and we've and I agree with Raja we're kind of getting there now because we had the the breath of fresh air that this represented but it was an acquired taste it was a high style act to want one of these houses and um and there was just as much commentary in the uh, New Canaan newspaper about how stupid this all was as there was about how wonderful it was. And then in the 80s, we had the, you know, we had the um, scene in the movie where it all falls apart. And there was pretty much a rejection of, of um, this. Uh, 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 and you could, you know, you could make a whole separate podcast about that, but uh, now, even the historically, you know, even the historically referential houses have very modern floor plans. They have huge glass areas in the facing the private spaces and on the site. They they're completely influenced by modernism, um, and and I know just uh, the, in watching my own kids, they they want that. It's part of their culture now. They, you so know, here's a, here's I have a image. Can, I, can I just comment on something? I have a theory about why it has not been so popular, which is, would, am I wrong in saying that a 
a distinct feature of modernism is minimalism? Yes or no? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so it is aesthetically beautiful. It's beautiful, it's very pleasing because it's clean and it's neat and there's lines and there's light and there's glass, but in practicality of life, um, unless you're single, unless you're a, a mature couple, unless, you know, where you can maintain and you can appreciate the aesthetic and you can maintain it, it is it in, in, in actual practical, you know, if you have children and you have, life is messy. It does not lend to that. And therefore it's beautiful for a second home. It's beautiful when your kids are gone. It's beautiful before you have kids. But when in the practicality of life, I don't see that it really fits for the majority of a lot of people. And that is why it is not as popular. Am I wrong? Mm. I don't think, yeah. it, I ahead, think it's pretty correct. I, I think that's a correct assessment. Um, I think there's, and I do represent a lot of, uh, you know, buyers and sellers of these, and I think there's a lifestyle component that goes along with it. And there are small, there are families who can do it, but they're not the majority of them. And I just want to correct one thing that John said, you know, New Canaan originally had about 125 of these, and we now have 91 still standing. And they are highly sought after, um, and you know that, it, but they're in such sort demand. But, you know, I think that I think there are a lot of people who, who I think would like to own one of these and would maybe consider building a new one. Um, but just the problem is also the cost of, you know, have, finding land to do so. So it sort of adds on to it, you know, the at length of the process and the cost of it. Uh, I won't disagree completely, though, with Roberto. I think uh, if you if you live in this open uh, environment of very clean surfaces, uh, that's a more challenging environment to live in. It, and, it's, and, and the person who wants that doesn't mind that. It's a buy-in. Um, right. And um, I don't think it uh, implies a particular type of person, although maybe it does, you know, maybe a single person or uh, empty people that don't have eight-year-old children probably would have less difficulty keeping it clean. But the, um, uh, I think the, um, it's just a, a completely different sensibility, you know, to take away all the layers of stuff and just experience uh, the space and the world you live in in a more abstract way. I, I just see a gradual evolution toward that. You know, there was an article I just spread the other day, I forget where, about uh, talking about whether Tesla is a, a luxury car because they sell for a luxury car price, but they're this very pared down, you know, no ambient lighting, no, uh, aromatherapy, no, you know, and the, um, uh, and the person writing the article said, well, it's that pared down abstract uh, outlook that is itself the luxury. And I, I think that that goes with these houses as well. Mm -hmm. um, Asia, I want to bring yeah. it up. I want you to I, reflect on this. Absolutely. This is, well, sorry, let me. The foreground is the ball house, the original 1954 structure. It's less than 2,000 feet. And in the back is your interpretation on the best way to expand this for a modern living. So, can you tell me, one, why now? Why does this make, why did you do it? And why does it make okay. sense now? Absolutely. Can I, John, before I answer that question, can I just step back and talk about what we were just talking about, the lifestyle change? And I can access to a project that we dealt with that exact specific subject about lifestyle. Charles Street and Paris Street, when we redesigned that with Meyer's office, it was the first apartment building that had floor to ceiling glass in New York. Every single developer, every single real estate broker, every expert that we talked to, they said, 
absolutely not. Nobody's going to live in a glass box in the middle of New York City. Absolutely impossible. You guys cannot do this. You guys cannot do floor to ceiling glass. It's going to have windows. It's going to have privacy. You're going to have closet space. You're going to have private bathrooms. It, we went completely on the other side of the spectrum. We, we said, no, this is not meant for the masses. This is meant for that select. And they are, it's one of the most expensive properties in New York when it came onto the market. Uh, and after that, there's so many buildings, like it became the standard to build floor to ceiling apartment buildings after that building. So it, it's, you know, sometimes we listen to the market, but sometimes it's actually good to go against the market because there's some incredible opportunities that are, you know, out there. And um, it, it literally defied every single person we talked to. They just looked at us and said, you guys are out of your mind. Nobody's going to move into this thing. And it, it completely sold, sold out within, before the construction was finished. So there is, there is a specific market. There are specific people who live in that. And I do know families who actually live in that. Roberta, back to your question. I knew I do know two families who have five, six-year-old kids who live in the you know no, in, in no the Chelsea, the church, It's like I, you know, they're actually I'm very saying, happy because the kids can't draw on the walls anymore. They give a magic mark and they draw on glass. And I it's totally clean. 100 percent I agree. It's just what I was saying. John's question right, was right. why is it not more popular to more mass, which is exactly, a very exactly. specific yeah. type. It's the same, I would say the same reason not everybody buys a Ferrari. 90% you know, of the people buy a Toyota Camry. And should we all design Toyota Camry? Not everybody buys certain... a Ferrari because they can't afford it. <laughs> That's true. We can buy a used Ferrari for the same price. <laughs> I know what you mean. I know what you mean. Absolutely. Um, but is it an affordability question? Really? That's one of the key questions of this hour. Right. Is is modern design for the rich only, or no. can somebody like IKEA show up and make it accessible to the masses? Let, let me share a picture for a minute, just um, if I may. Because the dream in 1929, that modern I showed you in Paris a moment ago, he said this is designed to be replicated, and you're supposed to have a whole neighborhood full of this design. And it didn't take off. And it didn't take off in 29. It didn't work in 59. And, and we're having a tough time making it affordable now. Even after we figured out things like IKEA, we still haven't figured out how to make modern accessible to the masses. John, people or don't want to live in the same house. People don't want to live in the same house that somebody else lives in. You want a sense of identity. You want a sense of individuality. You know. Cars are different than houses. So it's mass production on car is one thing. Mass production on, you know, on residential would be a complete different conversation. I don't, you know, I think I want to have my own house that represents who I am. Um, does that make sense? I mean, that's one of the reasons mass production architecture is never, you know, prefab, you know, it went on, it was done in the 60s, I think, with Sears and all these guys that tried to do that back then. It never, you know, never came through. And right now, all prefabs, I, to this, I haven't really seen a proper prefab currently done that is not made for mass production and is, you know, high quality, high end, expensive prefab. It's all container ships or small prefab, you know, small buildings. Yeah, and, and there have been a number of startups who have tried to do high style prefabs right. in a contemporary style. And they, they, the minute you've got a customer, it just it wrecks the economics of it because exactly. the slightest bit of customization makes it into a one-off. And, uh, and that's you know and, and that's kind of the big debate in, in talking about modern design. Is this industrialized and for you know for replication, or is it a uh, curated artwork you know for the a curated life? And uh, you know from the background I've lived through doing this stuff, I'd say it's the latter, not the former. Um, but I also wanted to I would just put point at a picture from uh, 
that I just thought I'd bring up, if that's okay, John, um, to say that, you know, modernism doesn't necessarily mean brittle surfaces that you can't mess up. You know, this is Elliot Noyes' own house, one of the seminal works of mid-century modern design and, uh, and of modernism in New Canaan. And you can see that, and, and, and really kind of one of the things New Canaan added to modernism was this much richer sense of materials, you know, with these stone walls mm -hmm. and some more elemental sense of materials that isn't so hard edged and brittle. This and was introduced by noise, you're saying? This was his house, yeah. This, but, but the stone, like that stone was it, because you see that a lot. That was introduced uh, by... You could debate who introduced it, but I would aver that it was noise who really made no, that uh, happen, right. yeah. And the materials that go right through the wall and become the interior and exterior materials. Raja and I both know how hard that is to do in actuality. <laughs> difficult to do that. <laughs> <laughs> but um, anyway, I just thought I'd, I'd, I'd point that out. It doesn't have to be so brittle, you know. So Pete makes a, uh, an interesting point in the chat. And he says, most people associate modern with mid-century, but modernism ranges from brutalism to more modern buildings like right. Olympic Tower. So yeah, how do you... Uh, is it include Gary? Is it include the... Well, yeah, actually, it's a really good point. One of those things that I think we kind of skipped over when, when uh, Roberta was asking about the history. So we have the Harvard Five, but Philip Johnson, when he was curator and he was grooming the next generation was the New York Five, which included Charles Guathme, Richard Meyer, Frank, um, Michael Graves, Peter Eisman, and John Haydeck, I think. Those are the New York Five. So this was the next generation that Frank Gehr sorry, uh, uh, Philip Johnson was grooming. So the question I have is like, they have basically, if you look at Richard Meyer's work, if you look at Charles Guathme's work, they are really kind of following that Mies van der Rohe slash Corbusier slash, you know, uh, Philip, they come keeping that tradition on. And the idea is how do we, what is the next generation? What is the next generation after the New York Five? I don't think, I don't think that really exists right now. So we've had Harvard Five, we had New York Five. There is, that's where it sort of stopped. So I think to me, Modernism didn't stop where the mid-century moderns and the Harvard Five. Actually, I think modernism kind of plateaued at the uh, New York Five. Uh, Robert, what do you think of that that scenario? I, that I, I completely agree with you. I I just stopped work, talking at some point, uh, and <laughs> uh, but <laughs> the the um, uh, you know, and here I'm going to um, you know if I can. Uh, well, what era they, are we they, in the New York? If you, if, if you, 1960s and 70s. Yeah. Uh, the, um, uh, and uh, Philip Johnson, you know, I, I like to call him the great impresario of American architecture. He performed that function and, and that's an essential function, you know, um, uh, you know, the Anna Wintour of architecture. And the um, uh, uh, and and he understood his his life that way, and he performed that as as his basic function. You could say he was better at that than at being an architect. You know, if you wanted to be a little daring, and um, and he promoted the New York Five without question. And there was a whole infrastructure. It wasn't just Philip Johnson, but a whole infrastructure by which these people were promoted. And the, um, and the last step in that, if I can uh, share the screen one more time. 
you know, we, we, take, we think of Philip Johnson as this, but Philip Johnson was also this. These are also on right. his estate. And uh, his and the the um, the library was designed by him in the 1970s. And but and the De Monsta, which is the red building, was definitely in homage to um, Frank Gehry. And you could say that Frank Gehry was the last guy that Philip Johnson um, kind of put in place or helped put in place. True. Very true. Uh, as, as Philip Johnson and, and declined, you know, moved out of that role, nobody moved into it. And uh, watching how that has occurred over the course of my life as an architect, it, you know, you need that person. You need Anna Wintour. And, you know, you may not like them, you know, but you, you need them. And the, uh, and so we quit moving, we, we quit having a clear path of progress when we quit having a clear um, infrastructure for, for saying what architecture is and who's doing Wait a minute. I've watched all kinds of very exciting buildings emerge on the London uh, uh, London skyline. I've seen some of the most uh, imaginative buildings show up in New York over the last 20 years. So we can't say that modern architecture is dead. I haven't really seen some of the excitement in the houses, but certainly the buildings, exciting buildings well, there's are dominating. A, oh. In, There's a in, huge uh, amount of great work being done. I, I'm not uh, saying that. I'm okay. saying there isn't a sense of a movement. There isn't a sense of what the dominant themes are. The structure, okay. just, yeah. Yeah. Well, um, that's actually kind of, John, that's sort of, um, if I can share a screen, John, um, it's, uh, one second, let me, so that's where, I mean, John, you asked me about the house that I did in, 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 in New Canaan, the design that I had for this project. Can you guys see the screen? Can you guys see the screen? Yeah. <laughs> and this is where, uh, I mean, I, I actually struggled with this quite a lot. It, it was challenging to me because this was a house that I was planning to build for my own, myself and family, but it needed to have... Uh, more than just a design significance to it. So to me, it, to me, the birth of modernism was Miss Van Drew because his attitude was like, I am not gonna, it's not the attitude, I'm gonna cross everybody behind me, I'm gonna do something new. It was basically, I'm gonna clear the table and only put what I quote unquote need. And that's what I'm gonna put onto the site. And so Miss Van Drew to me was the, my hero in architecture was Miss Van Drew, and obviously Philip Johnson worked with Miss Van Drew. And my background working with Richard and Charles Guafney. And so to me, getting an original Johnson house, which had that, that Miss Van Drew kind of inspiration, having Guafney's background, having that kind of significance of history and value was something that I was challenging myself to do. How am I gonna build an addition to a Johnson house with Ms. Van Drew's ideology in place and being completely respectful to what was done before at the same time with coming up with something new. Uh, does that make sense? That that's, when I said I was, I was losing sleep on this, I was not joking. I really did lose a lot of sleep on this design. So, um, so that's what the intention was. I mean, that's, I think, Robert, when you were talking about what's the next generation or what's the next step, you know, what is that term um, being uh, something on the coat of the giants, riding on the coat, uh, coat strength of giants? What is that, what is that right. expression? Uh, um, I'm not getting the expression correct. Uh, so on the but shoulders of giants. Exactly, building on the shoulders of giants. To me, this was a building that I was building with complete total respect to the New York Five, to the Harvard Five, but right. not copying them, not you know, not imitating them, not just cut and pasting from their work, but actually coming in and kind of creating something 
same design language, but pushing the envelope. And that's what I think New York Five was doing to Harvard Five because Harvard Five was very established based. New York Five came in, pushed it one step further. Um, Can you do something, something in conceptualizing this as far as like the tenets of what's most important? Are you, and when you're thinking and designing within that, that um, genre, are you right. thinking inside out or are you thinking Absolutely. outside in? Because it seems to me that a lot of, a lot of the structures you see in some of this modernism, and there's been kind, there's been some uh, like just almost not caring about what it almost looks like on the outside. And like, if you take that, if I extrapolate that out to like say Manhattan and what has been the most modern, we have a big problem in, in New York in the sense of modern because you have a multiplicity of units going up and down. And we were talking about differentiating. You didn't want to rep, you don't want to live in the same house that that guy lives in. You don't want right. to live in one of, you don't want to live in 8A because it's the same as 9A up to 25A. And then right. there are certain units and usually it changes. And the one, and a lot of people still are respectful, a lot of architects I find are respectful of the envelope. The one building, which is 56 Leonard, the Herzog and De Buren building, it's mm -hmm. like they wanted to make every floor different and they didn't care and they just stacked it up. And it actually is an aesthetically different look as well. I know I covered a lot there, but I just had to get that out of my head. No, no, it makes sense. Well, it, it, well in New York, there's a, you know, there's a real need for, for a stable language. And then if you're the, uh, the genius practitioner and you do this wonderful thing that just breaks that open, that's great. But if every Tom, Dick and Harry is breaking that open, all you have is yeah. a bunch of broken eggs. Absolutely. And the, uh, and if you imagine Park Avenue in the 1950s with all these limestone apartment houses extending all the way down to Grand Central, and then suddenly there's this one opening made for this bronze tower by Nice with, that is set back behind the street line with the plaza. That was the most dramatically beautiful thing. And then with, over the next 15 years, every developer built every which way um, of uh, freestanding towers with plazas in front of them. And it left nothing, it left no real coherent environment there. So the power of that original Mies building was uh, kind of liquidated. And so that, you know, you need the background and you need the feature and they need to coexist with each other. Uh, the Hertz, that Herzog and Devaran building is great in its context because it uh, is a, a genuine one-off right. statement. Yeah. And Roberto, that project, I mean, you, you have to throw in the economics, especially in New York, uh, economics into buildings. Uh, there's a lot of balcony space on that building. And that balcony yeah. space counts as half your... FAR. So a developer has to be willing to say, okay, I'm going to give up X amount of my square footage for a balcony space to do something different. You know, mm -hmm. they do that knowing that, okay, I'm going to give up this square footage that I can charge double what I'm charging for now, but by creating this iconic building, I can sell it for a lot more. So these, end of the day, these are economical, especially on a project at that scale. Yep. Uh, there is so much economics involved in those that um, it makes it very challenging. Um, but again, for example, this house, Roberto, I started with the floor plan. This was, I mean, this was a house that was meant for myself and my family. So the floor plan drove the idea, but the, it wasn't like chicken or the egg. Floor plan comes in, elevation comes second. No, the two came together. So right. when you do the floor plan, you realize, okay, what is this doing? What is that idea? What is the intention? What is the strategy? So the two went back and forth together. In New York City, usually the floor plan drives the elevation because the economics. So I think on a residential project of this scale, you can have that ability to have the two design process for the floor plan and the elevations go hand to hand. 
Um, but I think just one kind of comment that origin of this whole entire house was this one of the schemes that Philip Johnson had. This is, a, this is one of the schemes that Philip Johnson had for the glass house where he had one wall in the middle, living space on one side and bedrooms on the other side. This became, this became the, I mean, talking about history, building on the shoulders of giants, this is exactly the diagram of this project, which you have living room and dining room and kitchen on one side, public space. You have private space and support spaces here. So it, in essence, is kind of the same ideology as, you know, taking a Philip Johnson idea. So this is your living space, public, your private, and your support. And this is your main circulation across the whole entire site. It's a really beautiful house. Uh, and I really love the way you use the walls that extend beyond the spaces to string the site together and to import and to visually incorporate the Alice Ball House. Right. It's, uh, Thank you. It's really beautiful. How many square feet is this house? Uh, I don't have the numbers in front of it's me, but hold on. It including the Johnson House altogether should be about 11, but that's primarily, again, e economically driven. I'm going to build the maximum. Uh, uh, 11, what what? I can. 11, 11 thousand, thousand square feet. Yes. Okay, so just that, as a, a, a point of reference, I went to the glass house today, the original glass house, and two people asked, how big is this? <laughs> I guess they didn't hear the answer or they didn't believe it. 1,850 square feet. That's the original glass house. The Alice Ball House, and, and many, help me out here, Inger, most of the mid-century moderns were 2,000 feet, more or less. Yeah, no more than 3,000. So when yep. you talk about 11,000 square feet, Raja, something's changed since 1954. <laughs> it, yeah, I mean, the Alice Ball House, here's exact numbers. Alice Ball House is exactly 1,790 square feet, the new addition. But the thing is, but here's the key thing to the house. First floor is 2,800 square feet. The second floor down below. So the, the, the house that you guys are looking at is actually two floors that footprint actually mirrors itself down below. Um, so it's one floor is actually 1,000, sorry, 2,800 square feet, which is the right size for a three bedroom house. Um, I have a theory, I have a theory. Yes. Mid-century modern happened. We've just established a lot of those houses in New Canaan, 2,000 feet. I'm gonna tell you that most people's priorities when they come to New Canaan now, uh, they begin, they talk about ensuite. suite. I want a four or five bedroom house. I want ensuite suite bathrooms. Mm -hmm. I want an, a kitchen I can entertain in. Right. Um, two, two car garage, but probably three. So I, I would argue that the priorities of the 21st century family or even couple don't, don't lend themselves to what the mid-century moderns offer. Yeah, but you're comparing to mid-century modern that was done in the 60s. And what I think what Robert, Robert and I were saying that you cannot build a 1960s building now and try to sell it, it won't work. So you have to be able to adapt that kind of thinking, the modern thinking to the modern lifestyle that is needed right now. And that's why nobody is doing it. That's why there's not, that was a, I think that Roberto, that's what you were talking about lifestyle and what is being built is completely different because people think of modern buildings as 1960s mid-century buildings, not the modern buildings that are being built now. I mean, Richard Meyer's office, we're doing this incredible modern house in, in Switzerland right now, and it looks phenomenal. And it's, you know, it's a large house. It has, it doesn't resemble anything like the mid-century modern kind of project that we're talking about. Right. But but the, the photo that's up on the screen right now, the, the uh, rendering shows that you can sustain the scale. It's not so much the absolute number of square feet, it's sustaining the scale relationships and the and um, uh, the 
the way the scale relationships in, uh, of the new new house work with the existing Alice Ball house are very successful. So uh, even if the new house is much bigger, it's masking that that bigness uh, where it, it's relating architecturally to the other uh, thing. And that's, you know, that's what you want to see happen. Yep. Admittedly, a, a something today is going to be bigger. Of course. And, you know, and, and, and as, as a lifestyle element, you know, the public areas, the living room, dining room, kitchen area is open to public. The bedrooms are completely private in the back. I mean, the right. bedrooms are completely, uh, let me see if I can go to that. So this is the front from the main street. So you can see from the main road, you cannot see the living room space uh, at all. It's blocked. This is the bedrooms. The bedrooms have, this is the master bedroom, has a little, little jacuzzi open space here, little complete private backyard. Nobody can see it from back here. This is a privacy wall here. Um, main entrance, this is the public area. And this is, you're in the living room. And so here's, yes, yeah, sorry, go ahead, John. I, I have a different practical, please, please keep going. I have a practical no, no, question. The, the one question I had was, we keep forgetting this sense of proportions and geometry in, you know, what makes mid-century or modern buildings so powerful. I mean, to me personally, and I think everybody is different, but I mean, I'm, I'm going to pose this question to everybody on the call. Think of the last time you went to somebody's house. Think of the last time you went to uh, a hotel room. I guarantee you by the third step in the room, you've decided you like it, you don't like it. It has nothing to do with the color of the carpet, wallpaper, light fixture, anything. You walk in and you say, wow, that to me is where design happens. That's to me is a successful design. And what causes that or what, what triggers that wow factor is what I'm kind of driving for and striving for. And to me, the way I was able to establish that was the relation of the original house, which is, sorry, let me get this. So the relation of the original house to the relation of the new house and its relation to the human experience. This is all based on the Goldman section. So let me zoom into this. Um, How much land is that rectangle there? Uh, which one, the big one or the- The, the, the land, the land, that whole- 2.4 acres. Thank you, Anger. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so if I zoom in to this, let me zoom in. Why is it not zooming in? Oh. So if I zoom into this, the center of the golden section on the whole project is this space right there. Ah, what happened? Sorry, my screen is, <laughs> I press I pressed too many times on the, on the zoom button. <laughs> So the center of the entire golden section on the sense of proportion is right there. This zone mm. right there, which is literally your living room space. Oh, sorry. Which is right here, this chair, this sitting area, mm. which is this rendering. So when you sit, when you come into this house, and this is, these are the stuff, again, as I said, I, was, I, I lost a lot of sleep over because these are level of details that you would come in and you would sit there and you do not know why. I don't have an idea why, I, it, just, it just feels right. And to me, this sitting space was the key. I sit here and I feel like I am in proportion with everything around me on the site. So this was actually very critical to get this location for the golden section in place. And that, and that just talks about, that just describes in very succinctly what the difference is between 20th century modern architecture and historical styles of architecture. So Vitruvius back in, uh, you know, a couple of thousand years ago codified the proportions that would govern classical architecture and all the, neoclassical styles that followed it. 
and and those are codified because they look good and um turns out they often are based on things like golden proportion and um the modernists said well we don't really need to have the ionic order all we need is the golden proportion and um uh so it, it shows that this is all going after the same thing, which is how we perceive the world, and uh, but just abstracting it down to its essence. We have so a lot I'm, of realtors on the call. I, we only have a few minutes. I hate to get away from design, but I, I have to get to economics. Little discussion of economics before before we lose uh, run out of time. I think what we're talking about is beautiful and it makes sense geometrically, it's really expensive. If I have a client now who says, I want to build a new house in New Canaan, and they say, how much is it going to cost me to build an ordinary salt box colonial? I'm going to tell them about $400 a foot. And they're going to say, I get it. And then they say, what if I want a modern, like the ones you just showed me? And I'm going to say, and tell me if I'm wrong, Inger, or any of the other realtors on the call, or, or you two architects, I think the starting price is $1,000 a foot to get big, beautiful, oversized pieces of glass, to have a steel structure, not a wooden one. Am I wrong? Is it cost at least double to build the kinds of things that you're talking about? I don't think it, I don't know if it's double, but it's definitely a, a big premium. I don't, I'm, I, I'm really interested in what the real estate agents think too. Well, we um, haven't had that many new builds, so it's hard to say. I think. A, I think uh, a thousand is, is on the high side, but there's definitely a premium. Okay. John, my, my point of view on this is, again, I'm building my own house. So it's my money coming out of my own pocket. So I am being very, very conscious of all the money that I'm spending on this. So my approach, again, this house came to 2.4 to 2.6 million for construction, just the construction of this new building. Uh, which is a reasonable price. But I have a completely new scheme, new design for this whole scheme, which I'm not showing right now because it's still in development, that dramatically reduces the price and keeps the same design integrity in mind. But the key to that strategy is, and I think we're comparing apples and oranges here. You, we are building, we are trying to build modern buildings the same way we build traditional buildings or the same technology. I mean, listen, 16 inches on center studs is the same way the Amish build buildings in Pennsylvania from like 18th century. The, you know, the programs used to build buildings 16 inches on center. We are doing the same exact process. So we're trying to build high tech, modern, clean, minimalist houses the same way the programs used to do buildings you know, 80 years ago, 90 years ago. 100 years ago. So again, not going into prefab, but if we have a new system, like that's, I mean, the, the, what I'm planning to build is the new building is a new, it's not a prefab building, it's a prefab engineered component that you can bring into the site and customize it. Uh, like, an set, like, Almost, like an erector set, like Legos or an erector set. Yeah, something like that, that, you know, the simplified version of it, but it's not your traditional process. So I think that's what the big difference is. I, 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 I wish you luck. I, Thank I, you. Uh, <laughs> so do I. I, I, I the, you know, <laughs> we do have industrialized building all around us. You right. know, the middle class and rental housing is completely designed around uh, technology right. and, uh, and optimizes all these five-story, four-story podium buildings that you see mm -hmm. um, are, are, are refined down to the nth degree in terms of what they cost to build, right. not refined visually necessarily, <laughs> Because the materials that are are simple, cheap, and effective are often um, a little crude looking in the final product. I I think architects have been searching for how to overcome that 
as for for a hundred hundred or more years. Yeah, and I I think it's a really important search, but I don't think right. it's a finished search. I have a thousand questions, but I do have to ask this. So now the material, especially the glass, is so much more energy efficient. In the 1950s, glass was glass. That had to have been a resistance. And how did you, I mean, how do you, like, is your house, is it efficient? So is this, is this is for me, Roberto, or is it? Yeah, it, it, yeah sure. Uh, um, yes, yes. I mean, we have double glazed glass, which is very efficient. Uh, we have radiant heating across the whole house. We meet all the code requirements. It's, it's you know, efficient as it could be. I mean, it's not going to be as efficient as a, you know, a concrete box with, re, you know, yeah. with insulation yeah. all around it. But for normal living, it's perfectly fine. No. But was that a resistance to the popularity back in the 50s when glass was not holding in the heat? Well, I would, well uh, in the 1950s, the, the materials were not uh, very advanced, you know, especially in regard to energy issues, because nobody was thinking about those issues. So a lot of these houses, a lot of mid-century houses were designed with wood decking you know, kind of thick wood decking for the roof that could span eight feet. So you didn't have to have 16 inch centers of joists or anything, but it provided no place to put wiring or insulation. And so now when you go to restore one of those houses as we have, you um, are faced with a very difficult um, uh, restoration issue. And how are you going to add some insulation to this? Yeah. Uh, so it, the, the materials keep advancing and the codes keep advancing and they have to chase each other uh, to, to, make, you know, to make progress. Hey, Roberto, I'm in the process of actually completely gutting, I mean, gut renovation of the Alice Ball House. Complete new insulation system. We are ripping the entire roof off the building. Uh, of the whole entire building, the garage, the main building, everything is complete. The all the acoustic ceilings are removed. It's almost eighty-five to ninety percent complete gut renovation of the whole entire space. And we're opening the walls, and the contrasts are looking at each other like, "Oh my God, this is like nineteen fifties insulation." And it just baffles their minds, like, "Wow, you guys actually this has our value of two. Uh, so right now we're putting everything with the new what, technology. What is 1950s insulation? Crumpled up New York Times? Exactly. You're not <laughs> joking. You're, you're smiling, but that's pretty much what it is, actually. <laughs> I should get on eBay and start selling some of those insulation. I could take some money. But, but we're installing this new fiberglass insulation that you know used to be eight and a half inches thick. Now it's inch and a quarter. And it's like state-of-the-art fiberglass and they're installing it, and as we speak, actually, they started construction today on the on the roof. So I'm in that process of actually completely gutting the entire house. So you're more than welcome to come by and see what 1950s insulation looks like and the efficiency. Can I just add one thing? For you know, obviously, these houses originally were not efficient um, energy-wise, but you know, these architects were very wise in how they cited them to take advantage of passive and solar heat, the way they cited the house to take advantage of the morning sun, afternoon sun, right. the eaves that would hang over um, to protect the elements, both you know from the sun and the winter elements. So, I mean, Absolutely. I think that was some compensation. Inger, do you live in a mid-century modern? I live in a mid-century ranch. <laughs> I wish it, it were a modern. I wish it were a modern. Does it make you a better person? Would we all be better people if we lived in mid-century modern? I would say well, so. I try to live the lifestyle. <laughs> Less is more. Less is more. I can tell you definitely. Roberto, are you are you convinced? Are you you're um, in? The, you know what? You never. I, I was never skeptical. I I mean, I, again, I go back to like Rager was saying. You walk in, you want to say, "Wow, I like it." Mm -hmm. And it's so often, I mean, you'll see a piece of art, you see a car, you say, like, whoa, that's awesome. It just doesn't fit my life necessarily. It doesn't mean you don't love it. Like it's, the, right. that's the, 
that's the utopian way to live. It's extraordinary, it's beautiful, and what you design is amazing. But it doesn't it just doesn't suit a large portion of, of the populace. That's all. It's the when you get out of New Canaan, we're, so we're a bunch of new we're a bunch of New Canaan people talking about New Canaan because and, and, and as he says, he's got to stay within a framework, a certain framework, you know, because it's a Philip Johnson house. But you're in Southampton a good deal of the time. There are some moderns out there in the Hamptons. What does the rest of the world think when they see one of these out there in the Hamptons or somewhere else where they're not concentrated? What's some the people, reaction? I think, so, I think most people are like, wow, that's an amazing house. But it's also typically that house is $20 million. You know? I, I, think, mean, I, feel the need to, I feel the need to paraphrase you, Roberto. And, one person will walk into the house and say, oh, my God, less is more. And the other person is going to say, oh, my God, less is more clutter. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Very good. and, and um, uh, it takes all types, you know, but not everybody should live in a contemporary house. I mean. I mean, I have lived in a white box my entire life, ever since I was a little kid. I lived in a white box, the white couch with the white walls, with the white everything. And, you know, my two, my, I have twin five-year-olds and they come and they know they do not take the magic marker to the couch. It just becomes part of their life. You know, yeah. they, they, they take the magic markers to the glass and it's perfectly fine. I'll take Windex and I'll clean it up. And they actually love that, actually. So it just, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a lifestyle, Roberto. And it just, and they know you do not, you know, do but certain things. And it just- I live in a pre-war building and I have a pretty modern apartment. That's the way we designed it. But it takes maintenance. It takes- Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. What I'm warning is, I hope you're right, Raja, that the costs are become are making it more accessible to those right. of us. Because I have seen what we began the hour with, which right, is right. there is a tendency, and maybe it's a result of the fact that the Generation X is mm -hmm. different from the baby boomers, and they're not constrained by their parents' houses, so they're making different choices. There also, there's a tendency to want to live smaller these mm -hmm. days. There's a tendency to want to, to value the view and the, the indoor outdoor dynamics. So there's, there's a whole lot of different cultural changes, technology changes, economic changes taking place that would allow us to re-embrace mm -hmm. modernism. That's what I'm yeah. hearing. And, and, I, and I think we're doing it. Yeah. And yeah. you think we're doing it? Yeah. It's time. Uh, yeah, yeah I, I think one of the biggest shifts I think that would encourage that movement is to stop thinking of traditional way of construction, residential construction for modern buildings. And like what I'm actually doing, and one of those things that I'm kind of pushing my own limitations, uh, uh, we've done a lot of commercial buildings. And commercial, commercial architecture and construction has been value engineered to death. I mean, these developers want to value the value engineer to the minutest detail. So what I'm planning or what I'm attempting, and Roberto thankfully wished me luck on that, but I'm trying to attempting to take that commercial engineering, commercial way of construction, how do we convert that into residential without making it look like another office building, without making your house look like an office building. You know, how do we do that transition in a smooth way? And that's what I'm challenging myself with, trying to figure out how to economically do modern buildings using commercial ideology or commercial economics. Jack? Yeah, I just have a couple of comments. Uh, I'm a preservationist in the moderns, and I started out as I had a retail store in New Canaan for 38 years, and a lot of my clients were the designers and architects that we mentioned here. And uh, about 10 years ago, I began a driving tour as a preservation effort to, uh, I felt that uh, one person at a time, if you explain this history to them, 
the houses became safer, you know, through this process. So I just want to say that um, uh, I feel that there's a great interest in these homes. Um, they, I explain them, you know, sculptures you can live in, and this is a new chapter in uh, American art history. And I do feel there's, you know, a great acceptance of these homes. And I do feel there is an educational problem out there that this history is not known and the, the, it could be known a, a lot more. And as a preservationist, I also moved into selling real estate and selling moderns. And I just wanna mention the last two sales I had, uh, the houses were just over a million dollars. One was a Charles Forberg house. Uh, he was Walter Gropius's son-in-law and was uh, designed the Pan Am logo, the long house in East Hampton. And, uh, you know, when I arrived on the property, I mean, this is an issue. The owner had absolutely no idea of the history of his house. Yet, I do look for art-centric clients. They don't have to have a doctorate in modern uh, art. And uh, I've successfully sold many of these houses that would maybe be scraped. Uh, you return a year later, and they have a little pamphlet or a little booklet of all the articles and history of that house. So there is that interest grows and there, you know, they, there is a market. There is definitely a market and it doesn't have to be uh, expensive. They're like I say, there's houses that are less expensive. They're there in Wilton, they're in Reading, and they're also in New Canaan. And there is a ready market out there. Thank you, Jack. I think that's a great way to close the hour. Thank you, Roberto. Thank you guys so much. It was Thank amazing. You. We could just talk forever and loved it. Thank Great. you, Raja. Thank, Thank you, you. Robert. Uh, I think I learned you. a lot and I uh, got to know all of you so much better today. And uh, so I would like to close with uh, an offer. There is a, um, in one of the mid-century moderns, we're having a cocktail party from five to seven. I'm going to head up there now. I know Robert Dean is going to head up there now. I think Inger is going to head up there now. Yes, maybe. Um, I hope I see I, Jack I, there. So any of you who would like to jo join at 44 Benedict Hill Road, oh, okay. the Evans House of 1960, and uh, have a glass of wine. And But if you drink their wine and eat their food, please make a donation to the Historical Society. But I would like to invite any of you who would like to celebrate the moderns with me up there. They're concluding a modern a, a modern tour at with, with this cocktail party. But if any of you would like to join me up there, I'm sure you're welcome. So well, thank please. you, John. Excellent. Come on up and uh, we'll continue the conversation. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Raja. And thank, thank you, you again, Roberto. Pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.